Hello, I'm Brian Costello, uh, University of Chester, PhD student. A lot of today we're dealing with the posture of bodies. I'm going to be looking at a few ideas, just recently starting some research into this, so it's just a few ideas I'm starting with, with the position of early Anglo-Saxon curated objects, specifically loosely use the term heirloom, which I'll discuss because it's problematic in itself. But, and again, preliminary investigation of the positioning of curated early Anglo-Saxon objects and their visual roles in the social remembrance during funerals. Because of course, Anglo-Saxon funerals has discussed in a lot of literature how it was a mortuary ritual or to be a big gathering of people, a time of remembrance and of memory. And it's a portion of a larger investigation of early Anglo-Saxon heirlooms included in burials. And again, I use that term very loosely. But just for a synopsis real quick for non-medievalists or non-Anglo-Saxonists, for all you prehistorians out there, uh, 5th to 7th centuries AD, so a small window of the early period after the Roman migration period, furnished inhumations rather than cremations we'll be looking at because, again, this, the furnished graves are looking at remembering the identity or idealized identity of the person, including the position of the body and the artifacts included. Uh, this is a time of social stratification and political competition. Uh, we'll be looking at later on the cemetery of Mill Hill, I meant to say that. It's a case study I used. Looked at a few of the brooch placement on the supine burials is the case that I've looked at. And that's perfectly in this time of some of the first law codes, which kind of gives an insight to what's going on at this time as well. And of course, this is a funeral. It's a motive time of gathering and remembrance. Think of it as that as well. These objects being placed in uh, for the identity of the person Makes, gives people memories of them, of people of past times and pe places. But first, Anglo-Saxon views and reuse of old stuff. They really are interested in old stuff. First off, ancient monuments. Over half showed parcel reuse. A uh, third showed definite. Of course, the map of Mill Hill, which I will be using, reusing a Bronze Age uh, ring ditch. And also reuse of objects, such as Roman objects. Uh, Portway Andover using a perforated coin as a pendant, perforating through the head. So kind of give vision, did they really kind of know what this was or are they just doing it because they like the idea of something more ancient, something old? The same with on this girdle hanger where uh, Roman bracelets folded and put onto it. It's sort of remade into something new, given a new identity. And that gets into sort of the views of the distant past into the recent past. And of course, distant past, monument reuse, Roman objects, did they really know, or was this kind of the creation of myths, legends, stories of the unknown? But recent past, of their own objects and their own histories, sort of the curated objects that are mentioned throughout some of the literature, uh, could be their history, their ancestral stories, their objects, their families coming down. But first, what makes an heirloom? Objects imbue imbued with value by passing down new generations, accumulating long biographies. And as an example, this is a personal thing to me, and I really like this. If you can read it, it says second sparring, 31024. And this was actually my great, great, great uncle's when he was a boxer in 1924. He won this small pendant. And he gave it to my great grandfather when he started boxing in the Navy in World War II. And then when I started doing a little bit of amateur boxing, my great grandmother gave it to me. And it's just, of course, we can't put our Western thought into past civilization. But you think, like, the stories coming through this small object really heavy. It's got the inscribed date and everything, and this is something really kind of cool that everybody's always interested in seeing it. And I'm just starting to think, like, you have these gold objects, these, brooch, these brooches, these swords, these things that have been mentioned and maybe may heirlooms in the Anglo-Saxon period. Could they have thought the same way about these? And when they're depositing them in a grave, what did that do to the social memory, the remembering, the time, the storytelling at the funeral? And of course, gift giving. Giving it down. If it's not even in your family, like the cooler rings of the Tropian Islands, and actually... Unfurth's sword to Beowulf, it was his family heirloom sword, and he gave it to Beowulf. Was it still an heirloom sword? Well, but he gave it back, but did he know it was coming back? But, of course, there's problems with this. Uh, curation, identification, concerns and problems. Um, the chronological context of the grave. Thinking, when I started this research, saying, oh, of course, there's got to be an object that doesn't fit in a chronological date. must be an heirloom. Simple. No, not really. A lot of problems there. Age of heirlooms can vary. I mean, but not every heirloom has to be 300 years old. It could be 30 years old. So the window is very small. There's very small things in the methodology for this, of course, the initial stages, is sort of being built around other things. And there's always difficulties in dating certain items. Brooches are based on other grave goods, certain styles, and that can be problematic for very unique brooches. And swords are always a massive problem. 
Thought to be heirlooms because Sue Brunning's new work on the living sword showed the wearing on one side would be worn every day and seen publicly. So it was an everyday sort of thing, you know, passed down. But parts are stripped all the time. Like the sword, uh, sword from Bracknell Field, Grave 22 in Pusey, the only datable part is the mouth of the scabbard, really. The rest of the pieces, the pommel's very common from across all of Western Europe. But the scabbard piece was old, but that's something that could be interchangeable. Was it the same original scabbard? Was it found? Was it gotten from somewhere else? Did it just fit correctly? So there's always problems with dating certain objects. But back to the Anglo-Saxon heirlooms. Laws of Ethelbert kind of prove, Harker wrote that it shows that the objects are becoming heirlooms and it is passed down, it's an existing practice. Um, heirlooms are mentioned in a lot of studies, like I said before, but they're not really fully investigated. They're like, oh yes, this is probably an heirloom and that really is as far as it goes. So when I started this, this was one thing is the investigation of this going forth further and the effect on the position of the body. But looking forward a little bit for heirlooms, when there were heirlooms in the 9th and 10th century wills, of course, vast social and religious changes between the early and late periods of Anglo-Saxons, big time. But the problem is there is some interesting similarities between the inhumations and actually the personal items named in the wills. These wills, uh, reading is a lot of land being given to the church, a lot of land here, freeing slaves, possessions all going to the survivors, but also certain objects are named individually. Just like in the will of Winflade, she bequeathed her daughter her engraved bracelet and brooch. And then to her, it was either her son or grandson, Edwald, got her gold-adorned wooden cup that he may enlarge his uh, armlet with gold. And it's just kind of interesting to see these specifically named objects being passed down. Of course, a lot later, but it could give you an idea of these are the same things we find in inhumation graves as well, kind of showing their importance, such as brooches, swords, and feasting gear. I always find cups, bowls, and everything, just like her golden, gold wooden cup given to her grandson. But why deposit it? Why put it in a grave? Why kill it, really? Is it killing the object, a loss of cultural importance, or is it a lack of heirs? Uh, Katina Lilio said when an heirloom enters the archaeology record, uh, it, it's basically, or buried, it loses its significance. But I think it comes down to context, every different context. Anglo-Saxon burials were a big deal. It was a, a funerary ritual. It was a ceremony. So putting a known artifact in a grave would have a massive impact on the social memory and the remembrance at that funeral. Especially it's if it's something such as a very old and famous brooch that was worn on a day-to-day -day basis that people could see, or a sword that was worn on a day-to-day -day basis. Putting it in the ground, especially the loss of that, is a big statement. So, Cemetery of Mill Hill on the east coast of Kent. This uh, is a great cemetery for this because all but one burials were supine and it was a 6th to early 7th century cemetery with 76 graves that were pretty wealthy. And it's good that it's a 6th century, a later one, because it gives more chance to kind of find aged and curated objects in that small 200 year window. But the skeletal preservation was good enough for determining posture, which is very useful. But going back on, wealthy cemetery, 80% of all male inhumations <laughs> contain weapons, which is higher than the normal. I think the normal is around 50. And uh, wealthy and diverse female graves, Julian dress fasteners are various styles from continental Scandinavia, uh, France, other parts of England. So you have very different styles. So the variability at the cemetery was really interesting. And also the cemetery is based around a Bronze Age ring, ring ditch. So of course, connecting to an older area, an ancient area. And like I said before, apart from one, all burials were generally postured in a supine position. And when I'm looking at these brooches, which is very useful, because 13 out of 30 female animations contain brooches with a range of one to six, so quite a few. And where they were is, of course, Kent having a very diverse style for a dress, but just specifically at this time. You can see where they ended up in the, uh, the drawings up there. They're kind of central, a lot of these very central based. In some of these, looking at, got to look at three specifically, it's a mix of old and new styles of brooches. But there's also evidence of fly larva in uh, one of the, some of these graves at Mill Hill, giving evidence that these graves may have been open for a certain amount of time, kind of showing that there was a bit of time for a ritual, for people to come view the grave, for social remembrance. And uh, even the Ware Guild law from Ethelbert stated that a portion of the Ware Guild, which is the money paid for when someone was murdered to their family had to be paid at the open grave. So kind of showing that they had to be there at this ritual, at this funeral. And these brute brooches that we're going to look at for the next three, picked out three of the burials in here, 
are very central and very unique for the rest of the cemetery, which is really interesting. This is what I kind of picked out. So there could be multivocal focal points for social remembrance during this funeral, almost like amplifying the memory because everybody would have kind of known their uniqueness. Ooh. Like I said before, worn on a daily basis, publicly seen and known, specifically older, unique brooches, may have had more than one owner as well. So, the locations, combination of old and, more, old and worn and new and pristine. So we got a mix of both, different ages in some of these. Supine burials made the brooches very easily visible at these funerals if they are out there. Central base, they can see them. It, it would, would be visibly there. Um, across the torso area, as you can see, into the midsection, except for one that was the sort of standard elsewhere, like Anglian style, the two up here, and maybe one holding uh, a cloak on as well. Only one had that style, which is quite unique, and the brooches kind of reflect on that. Just like I said, outside of Kent, you have the two near the shoulders, different styles coming across, and maybe a third holding on a cloak or on a belt. But the cemetery, the three that I'm looking at is grave 61, 86, and 102. Just pick these three because they ranged from the beginning of the 6th century to the mid-6th century. The brooches are very unique as well as they're quite wealthy in their areas. So the first one, grave 61, this is interesting because the brooches line up in a very neat line when she was inhumed. And, uh, 20 to 25 years old, so she was middle, uh, not younger to middle-aged, but... Uh, Two pairs in a single, and the brooches are in a row, and may have been used for a different type of clothing for how they're lined up. So it's a interesting style of dress. And there's two bird brooches, display heavy wear and abrasion, and they quite possibly older than the individual themselves. So it seems like these brooches were older than the 20 to 25 year old. Here's a picture of them, they had garnet eyes, very nice. This one, E, which is right at the, the top in the middle, had a broken foot plate, showed a lot of wear and tear as well. And again, having this, sort of these Germanic style bird brooches connecting to the continent, maybe connecting to the stories of the migration over of the other older land, connecting and also to a 20 to 25 year old, it seems like if they are older than her, they would have to be either given or a gift or bought somewhere else, but even then they were older than her to begin with. So having that kind of has memories in itself adding to this person's, maybe making up for the memory she didn't get the complete, make up for the identity she didn't get the complete. Then we have a grave 86, a 40 to 50 year old, six brooches on this one. And this is the Anglian styled one with three abraded annular brooches that were created mostly in the East Anglia area but were found all over Kent. But the only one in the cemetery that had this style of dress. And but then three brand new radiate headed brooches from Frankia, Frankish brooches on the bottom where two of them were completely aesthetic. They really had no use. They were just there for style maybe, or just to be shown. And the interesting thing is where the left forearm ends up, it kind of shows where the hand was across the body, kind of ending at these brooches, almost pointing toward a little bit of a significance to them. There they are again. The annular brooch is very small, but up here, and then the radiate headed brooch is down here. And then grave 102, 35 to 45, a brand new Kentish disc brooch at the neck. Brand new, but two very old and worn and repaired brooches down at the midsection. One really is a hard time to think, well, Parfit and uh, Brugman thought it was very old because even the style is very unique. It's a mix of Judish and Kentish. They couldn't really pair it to any, and it was broken, snapped in half and repaired. And the other one, again, is a miniature bow brooch with a crouched animal design. So these things have great designs on them. All, excuse me, old, repaired, but paired up with a brand new Kentish disc. So it's kind of, again, pairing old and new. And what this whole thing says is really, what I'm interpreting this as is the competition here and also the memory, they're connecting to the past, connecting to different stories in a pretty competitive area, a very wealthy area. But these things, if they've been curated this long and put in these graves, it says a lot for the remembrance of these people at the grave. It's making a statement for having this, three of the most wealthiest graves too. I already did that one, there we go, went back. There it is. So, final thoughts. The variety of different types, ages, and placement of brooches at Mill Hill depict a more in-depth consideration and simple fashion choices. The specifically chosen placement, whether a part of the mortuary costume or laid on top of the body, created a visual focal point, which memories could be recreated, made, remembered, past stories, and specific unique individuals, tales, times. The connection of retained objects with the potentially long and full biographies 
to the deceased would have impacted the social remembrance of the individual by the mourners attending the funeral. The study of the deposition of curated Anglo-Saxon objects, their position, and their use as multivocal social memory focal points has a potential for further research in many different directions, including different types of objects, different positions, and especially taking this more out of just one cemetery, that the whole thing is to do majority of Anglo-Saxon in England and see if there's any patterns here looking for curated objects in the graves. Thank you. Thank you.